Why decide to fling yourself out of your cinematic comfort zone yeah. onto the terrifying thing that is the London's West End? Um, I've been meaning to do it for a long time, but it just the timings hadn't worked out, and I was looking for a very specific type of play, sort of a modern new writing, um, something sort of kind of naturalistic and 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 and. and Full of energy. I kind of wanted to start with something, and also in a small space, which uh, Trafalgar Studio is. It's a studio theatre, so there's a hundred oh, seats. Yes. It's a really intimate um, and 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 personal. Per, it's a very personal performance. Um, I saw Death of a Salesman there. Yeah, and it is. You are really there. I you mean, really you can are see the there. whites there's, of the eyes. There's no. There's no hiding. <laughs> no, um, so I, I was looking for a bunch of things, and also this play came along, and, and Stephen Caram, who won a Tony for his last play in New York, uh, the, the Humans. The Humans, yeah. Um, it was so brilliant, and this this is actually his first play. He's written three plays, and they're going to put his plays on in order, and this was his first one, and so it's the UK premiere of any of his work. Um, so it was just a, it was very, very exciting to be involved in a great cast and a great director. So what is at the heart of speech and debate? So it's about, as you said before, about three misfit teenagers in Salem, Oregon, who are brought together by a sex scandal in their school, but no one really takes them seriously until they speak out with hilarious consequences. And it's so dealing with, at the heart of it, it's dealing with uh, homophobia, online, piracy, online privacy, um, and sort of things that really m matter to teenagers, like getting a part in the school play. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's very smart writing um, and just about, it's kind of always about simple things, not that a sex scandal is simple things, but that's almost window dressing to actually what happens in the play. It's about seeing three young people who are on that borderline of adolescence um, where no adults are really taking them seriously, trying to come to terms with what it, what it is to be an adult when they're not, they're not quite emotionally equipped to be one. It's like a no man's land, isn't yeah, it? You've, yeah, yeah. Everybody's telling you, well, you're an adult now, but you might not necessarily yeah. feel like one of those. There's an awful lot going on, isn't there? Howie, your character, tell us about him because he's at the heart of, of this scandal. Yeah, well, there's, 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 I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but there's, sure. it's, 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 uh, <clears throat> there's, it's a three hander, well, there's four actors actually, but there's three, three um, teenagers. Um, I'm Howie, who's 18, and the other two are 16. Um, and he sort of gets himself into a bit of trouble online. He's, he was sort of grew up in Portland, but now is living in Salem, Oregon, which is sort of a bit of a nothing place in his eyes, anyway. Um, and so he kind of grew up in this very sort of liberal environment, and he's now stuck in his school, and he just wants to get his senior over with. And he sort of ends up going online looking for attachment with people and sort of gets himself into a bit of a pickle and um, sort of is, is just very worried about what he's been up to online, getting out, as you, as you can imagine, in school, you, you know, just being held back a year is is, is mortifying mm -hmm. enough. So if what he's been up to gets out, it would be it cause sort of a lot of controversy, and he'd be very unpopular. Um, but th th it's about three kids who come together to form a speech and debate team, and they put on like a, a musical, which is sort of based on the Crucible, crossed with uh, Wicked, crossed with... Um, it, it's a, a mashup of very weird genres. Um, some of them are there willingly, some aren't. How he's sort of going along with it because he doesn't want what what he, people may find out about him to come out. So he's sort of being manipulated into it. It's, it's very interesting. It's very it's a very funny play. It's a dark comedy, so it's yeah. a really entertaining ride. Are you tw 25 now, Douglas? 24. 24. Yeah. 25 so, in July. So yeah. not yeah. long well then, <laughs> really, to go back to your... <laughs> well researched. Well done, yeah, that yeah. man. Um, not that long then to look back into your teenage years no. as a, and play one, but does it? are there any correlations? Could you easily tap in? What were your teenage years like? Yeah, well, I, it's, I'm 24 now, so it's, yeah, it's a good couple of years ago, but I went into a school again to sort of try and remind me what it was Did like, you? and it's that, it's that smell as soon as you walk through the door has a very specific smell and my stomach just turned. I remember <laughs> I, I, I drove into the school car park and as I was parking, I was suddenly so... I, I'm normally an OK parker, but I suddenly was so <laughs> prang about... Just because you suddenly imagine everyone watching you and judging you and it's a very judgmental place, school, often, unfortunately. Um, but also what I noticed about teenagers, everything is very... Everything is the end of the world. Everything is very serious. Do you know what I mean? They take everything... Unlike actors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um... But no, I, I remember my teenage years. I, I I really thoroughly enjoyed them. I mean, I started working when I was sixteen, so I often would be out of school. Um, but um, I really thoroughly enjoyed them. But it, it's been interesting and a lot of fun to get back into that sort of mindset and be with two other fantastic other young actors and sort of create that with them. Um, how old were you when 
you were told that you were dyslexic? Um, you have done your research. Uh, I was I was really young. I remember I was in primary school, probably like year one. Right. Okay. So how, I remember on. I used to have those glasses. I, was, I look really geeky with the, these sort of these glasses with different tints on, with colours, trying to sort of to help me read. Um, so really young, it kind of and that sort of pushed me into the creative field that I'm in now. Really, sort of, I I, I knew I. I've always enjoyed academic work, but I just knew it's never, my brain doesn't quite processes, process it in the quite way, correct way for me to sort of take it as a career. So it pushed me into more creative field, really. Because we um, recently did a whole show about dyslexia and um, you were quite lucky in that respect because there's some young people that go through their whole school life without knowing about it and they're made to feel inadequate because of it. So does that mean the schools you went to were able to, to kind of to, to show that you were still intelligent yeah. and that you could still be pushed in different ways? I think some schools were better at it than others, um, and I was had I was very lucky to have a, a sort of supportive family. Um, but yeah, no, I mean there were definitely times where uh, times where people didn't understand, and y you found yourself kind of upset as a, a young person having to work doubly as hard as everyone else to try and achieve the same goals. And it it, it, could, it could be tricky at times, but I'm not one to complain. I think I was one of the lucky ones. People sort of picked out early, and it. I, I, I'm thankful that it pushed me in, and to use more of a creative part of my brain. I wanted to become I wanted to become a young Louis Armstrong when I was a kid because my grandparents loved jazz music. I took up the trumpet. But then eventually when that I felt like that wasn't cool anymore, although that is probably the coolest thing in the world, I sort of moved over to acting when I got cast in a school play and then that sort of took over really. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Um in this day and age, when you're sent, you know, huge scripts, scripts. Now I don't know how wordy this particular uh, play that you're currently in is, but you know, when you're sent these scripts, how does it work? What's the process? It normally takes me a whole day. Some people can read a script in two hours, but it takes me it takes me a good sort of five hours to get through one. And but just maybe maybe because my brain processes it processes it in a different ways. Sort of just I really sort of visualize everything and I take it very slowly and sort of take it all in. But it can be difficult. But no, this play is a wordy play. It's just people talking basically for an hour and 20 minutes, hour and 20 minutes <laughs> just three you know three four of us just just back and forth back and forth mm -hmm. but you know you have, that's why you have a four week rehearsal process which i'm in right now i'm literally on my lunch break i've, I've run out from rehearsal now. Thank um, you. well it's much prettier yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're only up the road at yeah. mbh to trafalgar um, square so um yeah so i it just just a lot of work a lot of repetition um but no, I think it's. It, I think I've learned to deal with it. It used to be more difficult, um, but it's just the same way a carpenter learns how to car carve a chair. I sort of train my brain how to learn lines. It's just a part of our job. It's just a part of the craft, I mm -hmm. suppose. Yeah. You've been in some pretty amazing things. Worried about the boy with it was your portrayal of Boy George, yeah. which I, I really, really enjoyed. Um, oh, and you. the Pillars of the Earth, Riot Club, Romeo and Juliet. And of course, Noah, Darren Aronofsky's film, yeah. where you were alongside Russell Crowe playing Shem. Um, what was that like, that whole Darren Aronofsky massive experience? Yeah. I mean, he's such a phenomenal filmmaker. Um, and obviously working with Russell, who's sort of been a childhood hero of mine, I sort of must have watched Gladiator about ten times. Um, it was it was fantastic, uh, and I've I've been very fortunate to work with some really amazing amazing visionary filmmakers like Darren or the Wachowski siblings. Mm -hmm. um, and you just to be around those creative minds is uh, I'm just very fortunate, and to work with all the people that I have worked with. Uh, but no, Noah was a massive movie. I mean, they built that arc in reality. It took them six months to build. They built it to scale um, in Long Island in New York. And there was a moment, a pinch myself moment, when you're on top of that thing and they're sort of, they had, they built the most high tech rain machine that'd ever been built and they sort yeah. of put 5,000 gallons of water down a minute on top of you. And there's sort of Russell Crowe sort of jumping around with an axe sort of. That's just a normal people. weekend for Russell Crowe. Yeah, isn't yeah. It? <laughs> Um, no comment. Uh, um, but yeah, and it was just it was a pinch myself moment. Yeah, r really fortunate to travel and do the the things that I do. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean I know that you've you've modelled very successfully as well. You know what the what the life is like, that the life of fame. But you had a bit of a, a wake up call when you were chased by paparazzi in Paris with Miley Cyrus. Is that right? Um, yeah. As you do. I mean, I, I'm my, one of my first American movies when I was 18. I did this film with Demi Moore and Miley Cyrus, which it was a bit of a wake-up call. I sort of realised what it was to sort of be completely in, um, impris imprisoned by the amount of attention you've got. Like, I remember she couldn't leave the hotel. Um, she was just, there was like, there was about 400 people outside the whole time and about 40 paparazzi following wherever you went. Mm -hmm. um, like, almost on 40 mopeds. So that was kind of strange. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, fame is a, is, is a strange thing and it's something that you sort of have to get used to. But I, I'm sort of... 
I'm just very happy living in London, pottering around on my bike, um, getting on with it here. So, I hate to tell you this, but you're likely to become very rather famous, Douglas. It's probably, it looks <laughs> like you're already well on the way. How do you equip yourself for that? Um, I think just focus on the reason why you're doing it, which is um, the love of the work um, and the material and the stuff that you, you do. And so don't get sort of... Um, don't don't sort of fall in love with the trappings that come with it because really they're sort of quite fickle on the outside. I think. Mm -hmm. um, is that why working with um, United Nations Commission on Refugees is important to you? You're recently back from Afghanistan, right? It, Iraq, yeah. Iraq, sorry, Iraq, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I I think that it, I've always been very uh, sort of aware of you know, uh, affairs in the world. I've always, my favourite TV show kind of grew up was always BBC News 24. I've always been obsessed with the news and see, I've been very aware of what's going on in the world. And so it was kind of a natural progression to start working with the UN's refugee agency. Um, and I, yeah, I went out to Lesbos in Greece and met refugees who sort of made that dangerous sea crossing across to Europe and um, also went to Iraq to meet internally displaced Iraqis who were sort of being forced out of Mosul by, um, well, IS and Iraq forces clashing. The Iraqi government forces clashing, um, but yeah, no, I think it's that th there is nothing more fulfilling than um, spending your days sort of focusing on, on, on your t days off focusing on, on on issues like that. I mean, you've seen the amount of abuse people like Gary Lineker and Lily Allen have got online for people mm. talking in support of refugees, and especially when you are like Lily and like um, Gary, who, who care very deeply about this issue, but also lead relatively speaking, quite privileged lives. Mm. How do you feel about potentially that kind of criticism coming towards, you know, you hear it all the time, don't you, these lovies lecturing us on how to look yeah, after people? Yeah, I would, I'd hope I was sort of never, a, would never be a lovey lecturing anyone. I try not, never to lecture anyone in life in, in, in general because it's... Uh, Tends to backfire. Yeah, because, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it's not about that. I think I just, I treat it as, I just do what I can. I know that if I was in... I would hope that if I was in such a desperate situation um, that others would be there to look out for me too. So I just, I just try and keep, keep it on a, on a more base level. How does it change you when you go to a place like that and you see that level of suffering close up? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, that's a hard question. It, 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 cha it changes you... Um, it changes you a lot because, and, and it fills you know it fills you with guilt because you you're, you're, you can sort of get back on a plane and sort of leave it behind, um, and it makes you feel very grateful for the for the country that you've been uh, brought up in, and 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 yeah, it, it does change you though because uh, to witness some grief, to to speak to someone who's literally lost their daughter or their sister or their brother or mother hours before you're chatting to them is is it's kind of a harrowing thing and um, just makes you feel very grateful for everything you have and very compassionate um, towards those who have not been so lucky and uh, even more determined to, um, to do whatever you can, big or small, to help. Douglas, you went on with the Women's March last month as well. Why was that important to you? Um, God, I mean, I don't want to get too political. I came here to promote a play. <laughs> um, but no, uh, uh, why... Um, I because guess it's inevitable, have, um, though, have, isn't it? Because yeah, because yeah, well, it is a political play. But I, I, <laughs> I have, I have a, um, I have a mother, and I have a sister, and I have a girlfriend, and um, they will never know what it what it is to be born um, into this world a white privileged male, um, and that 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 they they have to um, you know deal with with you know patriarchy and, and and things that i will never have to i will never quite be able to um comprehend but just because of the way you know being born as i am and i think it was just very important for me to stand up and and support them on that day and also um uh you know show that i i don't believe in regressive politics and um it's been a long hard struggle for women to uh receive you know, to get the rights that they deserve and they shouldn't even have to be fighting for and I think it's not the time to be moving backwards it's the time to be moving forwards. Mm -hmm. Well then to talk a little bit more then about speech and debate um online privacy. <laughs> a sigh of relief. Oh my gosh thank you. Look, you look like you were in pain there love you <laughs> yeah. really did. Um so online privacy big issue uh, addressed in the 
in the play. And because Howie is, we don't want to give it too much away, but Howie becomes a, a bit of a victim of that and the problems with that. Is that something that you are concerned about? I've got to say, it's always something that I don't feel that I'm on top of online, online privacy. Online privacy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it just completely terrifies me. All the, me you know, too. The, the, you get confused. There's, there's so many clouds and things and passwords and everything has your details <laughs> saved before you, you just forget to use your brain. So. Yeah, I suppose you have to just. Yes, I am, but I, I, I yeah, it, I don't, I don't sort of stay up sweating about it. But it is something, and I also do think, but I do think it is important to protect children, and I think children ha grow up quicker than they should do these days. Um, and I, when I was a kid, it was the very beginning of all of that MSN and mm -hmm. all the stuff like that. And there were definitely times when, when uh, my peers and stuff were probably were exposed to things that they shouldn't be. Um, you know, so I think it is important. Um, so yeah, are you? Uh, do you ever have to check yourself for oversharing? Do you ever worry? For, with whom? Social, social media. media. Um, you know, are no. you on Snapchat? No, I'm not on Snapchat. Um, I just have I have a uh, Instagram official Instagram, official Facebook, and Twitter, which I use for you know promoting jobs that I'm doing or or causes that I'm passionate about or you know occasional you know, uh, pictures of what I'm up to. But, you know, I, 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 I never sort of put myself out there too um, publicly. I don't think. That's interesting. It would sound like somebody who perhaps uses it because you have to rather than because you enjoy it. A reluctant <laughs> tweeter. Is that fair? Maybe. maybe. <laughs> I mean, I do enjoy it. And, I, I, you know, t I think Twitter is great for news and keeping up to date um, with what's going on. And it's a very instant um, satisfying, and by also Instagram, I like taking pictures. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's on a very simple level. <laughs> and and you know, you do have a unique take on going to places that other people wouldn't be able to go to and seeing things that other people can't see. Uh, you know, yeah. Apart and from a large able, green screen, obviously. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, and being able to give a voice to certain people that don't have a voice, I suppose, as well. Brilliant. Somebody's just texted the programme. Uh, did she really just say you were about to become very famous? Yes, I did just say that, and that's because I'm entirely right. You wait and see. <laughs> Douglas Booth will be, if he's not already, very famous indeed. Very, very good to talk to you, Douglas. Thanks really for being lovely. on the programme.